Um, I want to really sincerely thank the organizers for bringing me over here. Um, it's great to be in London. Um, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and I was honestly a little overwhelmed when my talk submission was accepted. Um, so thank you very much um, for your vote of confidence. Typically, I work very hard to craft my talks and rehearse them and make them as tight as I can, and this one has been eluding me a little bit. Um, it's much more personal than any talk I've ever given. I'm a lot more nervous than I've ever been giving a talk before. Um, I'm not actually going to guarantee that it's going to hang together. Um, so if I stumble my way through the next half an hour, um, please bear with me. Um, I think we'll just have to see what happens. So my personal DevOps journey actually started many years ago um, when I read a single paragraph in a book about AI about a guy named Norbert Wiener and this thing he was into called control theory. And I didn't think very much of it at the time. I just kind of went on with my life and fast forward 25 or 30 years. And I was in the library one day looking for something to read. Um, and I saw a book on display called Dark Hero of the Information Age. It was a biography of Norbert Wiener. And I thought, oh, I remember that guy. I should find out more about him. And that turned out to be a really big mistake because I became instantly captivated with the whole idea of cybernetics, the idea of control as adaptation and listening and allowing yourself to be influenced by the thing that you're trying to control. And I began to see cybernetics everywhere I looked. And in particular, I recognized it as the common underlying foundation behind Agile and DevOps and design thinking and lean startup. And I found it so compelling that I ended up writing a book um, about taking a radically cybernetic approach to the whole prospect of digital transformation. And along the way, as I was reading everything I could get my hands on about cybernetics, um, I encountered one of the most interesting people working with it today, Paul Pangaro. And through him, his student, Sung Chan Lim, who had written a book called Realizing Empathy. And in it, he talked about how he had first encountered empathy while taking a furniture making class. When his teacher um, explained to him that he couldn't just hack at the wood to try and make it do what he wanted, he had to actually listen to what the wood was telling him about how it wanted to be worked with. And because I have this habit of making strange and unexpected connections between things, I saw this as a metaphor for DevOps, both the relationship between Dev and Ops, as well as the relationship between people and the systems that we're trying to control. And so about four years ago, I started speaking and talking about the idea that empathy was really the essence of what DevOps is. And a remarkable thing happened the community grabbed hold of this idea and ran with it. And very quickly, it reached the point where you couldn't go to a DevOps conference, you couldn't have a DevOps conversation without talking about empathy. And I think that's a really wonderful thing. I think it's something we should be really proud of. You know, when you look at our industry, you might not expect us to be the folks who make empathy the center of an entire fundamental approach to organizational design. But I think it's something that we really have to offer to other disciplines as an example of how to approach all this stuff we're trying to do. So I, I think we really should feel like we've accomplished something special and remarkable in what we've done. That being said, we still have work to do. Empathy is hard. And we always tend to fall back on our habits. I was at an Agile software conference this year, and there was a keynote about empathy. I got very excited. Yay, empathy. Yay, us. Until the speaker made the comment that, well, you all have the capacity to empathize, except maybe people with autism. And I found myself getting very upset by this for a couple of reasons. The first is that it turns out not to be true. We can thank Simon Baron Cohen, Borat's cousin, for the idea that 
An absence of empathy is the defining characteristic of autism. But researchers have shown that to not actually be the case, that if anything, we empathize more intensely than neurotypical people do. And as a result, we tend to get overwhelmed by it and start to shut down, which is why it may seem like we don't empathize. The second reason I was upset is you may have noticed I've been using the word we and not they. As a person who is myself on the autism spectrum, it was difficult for me not to take her comment personally. And the irony was that I was empathizing with her talk really intensely. There were a few momentary glitches along the way. It wasn't a big deal. It didn't detract from her talk. It was the kind of thing that happens to us all the time. You're going along, and all of a sudden, you realize you have no idea what you want to say next. And you freeze for a minute. Uh, and then you remember and you go on and everything's fine. And I was experiencing those moments in her talk as if they were happening to me. So if autism is not defined by an absence of empathy, what is it? Well, that's a tricky question because it, it involves a whole constellation of characteristics and experiences and no two people have exactly the same combination. And that's why sometimes you may hear the, the saying that when you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. But what I've noticed is that the world tends to view it in general as something missing, as a lack of something, whether it be a lack of empathy or a missing protein in our genetic structure or not getting enough oxygen while we're being born or whatever it might be. I think I've only ever encountered one study where researchers were trying to figure out why is it that autistic people are better at this particular thing. And the irony is that because of our very struggle, in many ways we are actually more capable, not less. One of the things we tend to share is anxiety. You know, if you're on vacation, and you're at the beach, and the sun is shining, and your phone is off, your anxiety level is probably somewhere around zero. Where for us, it's more like three or four. And that can make seemingly simple, ordinary activities a lot harder. One of the ways that my anxiety manifests is in navigating physical space. In Minneapolis, where I live, we have something called the Skyway System, which is a series of enclosed walkways that connect the major downtown buildings so that in the winter when it's 30 below out, you don't have to go outside in order to walk around. Well, I don't use the Skyway because I get very quickly lost and panicky. So it'll be snowy and icy out and I'll be down on the sidewalk walking around outside. I once had a job working in a building that was shaped like a very long and shallow W. And it was really easy to get turned around and you could literally walk to the wrong end of the building before you realized your mistake. So you could leave early for a meeting and end up showing up late. And my first three weeks at that job were one continuous panic attack. Every time I went home, every day, I wanted, literally wanted to quit. And I had to force myself to go back to work in the morning. But I didn't quit. I persevered. And eventually, over the course of several weeks, I started to figure things out, and I started to settle down and feel more comfortable. Imagine that you run six miles to work every morning, or your office is at the top of a steep mountain, and instead of driving, you hike up the mountain with a backpack, 50-pound backpack on your back. People would think that you're pretty remarkable. Wow, look at them, they're amazing. They run six miles every morning and then they do a full day's work like the rest of us. Well, that's what we do just showing up. Every day in our ordinary lives, we demonstrate a tremendous amount of courage and commitment and determination. And not only it's not just a matter that we should be admired for our ability to navigate our ordinary lives. We actually have a lot to contribute and a lot to offer to neurotypical people and to the world at large. 
When we talk about things like accommodations, there's this subtle idea at play that, well, we're fine. You can't quite handle things, so we'll accommodate you. But oftentimes, when you do things to accommodate autistic people, it actually can make things better for everyone. For me, things like televisions and airports and open plan office spaces are a nightmare. But lo and behold, now we're finding out that open plan office spaces are a nightmare for everyone. And imagine if we turned off all the televisions in all the airports. And suddenly we weren't being constantly bombarded by the latest natural and political disaster while we're waiting to get on the airplane. I'm willing to bet that we all might be just a little bit more relaxed and a little bit more mindful and a little bit more kind. Now, I'm not actually here to give a talk about autism. What I want to do is explore what empathy for the autistic experience can teach us about empathizing with each other in general in a deeper way. And the key thing that I want to explore is the need to beware of assumptions. Anytime we believe that we know something, rather than leaping to draw conclusions from it, we could instead use it as an opportunity to question ourselves. For example, don't assume that what you see is what you get. When you experience resistance or grumpiness or lack of engagement to the new thing that you want to introduce, don't assume that it means the person doesn't care or they don't get it or they're not interested in making things better. Don't assume that you actually know more than they do or you are wiser than they are. When you explain how containers and microservices are gonna solve all the problems, and the answer you get is, hmm, that sounds like an operational nightmare to me. Well, they might actually be right. You might want to incorporate that into your thinking. Don't assume that just because somebody has been doing something in a particular way for a very long time, that they can't do things differently under the right conditions. I have had the very humbling experience of introducing flow-based work management to teams that have been working in silos with queues and ticketing systems for decades. And some of them are only a few years or even a few months from retirement. And I've assumed that it would be a long and painful process, a little like pulling teeth. And then I've been very pleasantly shocked to find out that after a few weeks, I don't even need to go to the stand-up that I set up because they've figured it out. They're actually doing it right. They've stood, understood the essence of what I was trying to teach them very, very quickly. Now, the reason that we have these friction points is because we're trying to make things better. And that's wonderful, it's what we do. It's actually what our industry is about. Every time you write a line of code, every time you deploy that line of code, you're changing the world in some very small way. But we need to realize that there's actually no such thing as things by themselves, whether that be systems or processes or methodologies, separate from the people who operate those things or live within them. So we need to be careful in how we use language and not talk about people as if they're things. So when we say things like, well, cab is waste, we should get rid of it. Well, what about the people on the cab? What about the change manager? Are they waste too? I become more and more careful about how I use that word and I've actually started not using it at all and instead talking about delay and work in progress and handoffs. I recently met with a prospective client um, and they were, he was uh, showing me around his office and at one point he stopped and very proudly told me that this is where our DevOps team sits. And I had to bite my tongue and keep from saying, well, you failed the first test because we all know that if you have a DevOps team, you're doing it wrong. Um, it's not the kind of thing that you want to say when you're trying to get work from someone. But when he explained to me what it was that his DevOps team did, I realized 
that if he had said, this is where our SRE team sits, everything would have been fine. And sometimes it's just a matter of perspective. Some of you may remember the no-ops controversy. Um, nearly all the things that no-ops was telling us we should stop doing were good things not to do anymore. But I think the controversy arose because what we unintentionally communicated, I'm gonna wait, make you wait for this one. <laughs> what we unintentionally communicated was the idea that we were so excited about declaring a whole class of people dispensable and getting rid of them that we came up with a catchy name for it. When people ask how it is that Netflix can move so fast, they point to trust and freedom. And they can trust people because they hire the top 1%. Now, aside from that being just a little ironic because it's not scalable, the more important question is what about the other 99% of us? Whether you're talking about the top 1% or the 10 Xers or the gurus and rock stars or even just the idea that the way to innovate is to put a bunch of smart people in a room and let them solve problems together, if we're struggling, does that mean that we're just too dumb? If software really is eating the world, and if every company really does need to become a software company, that means that we need all 100% of us. So what's the alternative? The alternative is to seek the wisdom in everyone. To assume that everyone we're working with, everyone we're trying to bring along, everyone we think might be in the way, has some kind of intelligence, experience, thoughtfulness, something of value that they can contribute that we might want to figure out how to leverage and incorporate. There was a wonderful story in the news recently about a grocery clerk whose job it was to stock the beverage cooler in the supermarket. And there was a customer who was autistic who would come into the store every day and just stand and watch him stack the cooler. He was fascinated by it. And instead of calling security or telling the guy to leave or laughing at him or just ignoring him, what he did was he got him to start helping stock the cooler. He assumed that behind this seemingly weird behavior was something of value, something to contribute. And the bonus was that this autistic person's family was so thrilled that someone had treated their son with some level of respect and dignity and interest that they started a fund that raised enough money to send the grocery clerk to college. We work in an industry and we live in a society that's become obsessed with the big and the grandiose. The billionaires who will save the planet, the unicorn companies that will disrupt how we walk and drive and sleep and eat and think. And we tend to lose touch with the value of the simple and the small and the seemingly ordinary. You know, in Agile and DevOps, we talk about making things smaller. But we seem to struggle with the idea of making our vision smaller. We don't understand how that can work to get us where we want. This is the Roby House. It was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright around the turn of the 20th century. And when it was built, it was considered revolutionary because the roof line is almost perfectly flat. And this was in an era when most houses were still Victorian style. They were tall and skinny and pointy. But if you look at Frank Lloyd Wright's work during the 10 years leading up to this, he started out designing tall, skinny, pointy houses like everybody else. And then he made them a little flatter, and a little flatter, and a little flatter, until he reached the ultimate expression and invented a completely new architectural style. I hear people say that incremental innovation isn't enough. We need breakthrough innovation. But I want to challenge the real difference between them. To me, the difference is simply that you don't stop making one small change or experiment after another. 
The other problem with these big visions is that people tend to get left behind. You either get cloud native or you don't. Not all of you will make it through this transformation. Survival is not mandatory. Now, on the one hand, we live in the context of companies and organizations and systems and ways of doing things that continually come into and out of being. But on the other hand, ultimately, and I, to our credit, I think one of the things that the DevOps community has understood is that it comes down to people. In most industries, when there's a major disruption, there's some assumption that we have an obligation to figure out how to bring people along through that disruption and figure out how they can take their ordinary wisdom and capability with them from the old world into the new world. So we need to ask ourselves whether we have a similar obligation, not just to design for change, but design for the adoption and the adaptation of that change. So if we are going to truly build empathy deeply into how we go about our work. It's not just some thing or some state that we achieve and then we can say, oh, we have an empathetic org chart or we have empathetic stand-ups or whatever the case may be. But it is a never-ending and never complete process of asking questions and becoming more and more open. And to do that, we need to bring curiosity with us. What is behind that resistance? What is the insight that I might be missing? What do they have to offer? We need to bring humility along. What is it that they understand that I don't? We need to realize that there's no such thing as a full stack human being. And most importantly, we need the willingness and the ability to listen. Agile and DevOps are all about feedback loops, but it's amazing how many times I work with clients that are really good at collecting feedback, but they don't really do anything with it. They don't really allow themselves to be changed by it. Often in my work, I encounter teams that are at loggerheads with each other. And sometimes what I do is I lead them through a mutual listening and joint design exercise where each team will have a certain amount of time where they can talk about what they need, about what's frustrating them about the relationship, about what isn't working. And the other team is asked to just listen. No interruptions, no questions, not even note taking. To just openly and receptively listen. And then we flip it. And each team has the opportunity to talk. And each team has the sense that the other team has at least made the effort to listen to them. And what I find often is that something magical happens when they start trying to solve their joint problem together, which is that instead of saying things like, well, we need you to do this so that things will work better for us, they start saying, well, we need to change this in order to make things better for you. When I was preparing this talk, I ran across a quote that at the time I thought perfectly expressed what it is I wanted to say today. This is from the 1985 Apple II Human Interface Guidelines. And where it says interface and program, you can just replace that with anything you're trying to change. Agile or DevOps or using JIRA or getting rid of JIRA or doing Scrum or not doing Scrum or whatever it might be. You must remember that you are dealing with a human being and tailor your interface to deal gently with the kind of fears and anxieties that the very existence of your program may provoke. And I think that's very true. But as I thought about it more, I realize that there's a subtle assumption at play here. The assumption is that we're smart and we're strong and we're knowledgeable and they're weak 
And they need us to be kind and gentle. And I think we actually have to go beyond that. We have to learn to respect people's struggle, whether it be an autistic person's struggle to find their way around a building, or a VMware administrator's struggle to understand containers and bare metal, for its own sake, and not try to get rid of it or overcome it too quickly. To recognize that there is strength and power and value and courage in the struggle itself. The truth is that we all struggle. Facebook and Twitter are struggling with monumental unintended consequences way beyond their ability to predict and way beyond their ability to control in any traditional fashion. One of the things that DevOps has taught us, or taught me at least, is that the socio-technical systems that we're managing are complex now, not complicated. And they can't be modeled or predicted or controlled the way we're used to controlling and managing systems. And the truth is that we never know exactly where we are or what we have. In a sense, we're all lost in the skyway, and we're not sure where to go next. And even if there's a signpost telling you where to go, you can't guarantee that when you get there, it will still be where you want it to get. So in closing, one of the things that I've heard more and more is the idea that DevOps is bigger than DevOps. And on the one hand, I think that presents us with a bit of a naming problem. You know, is it DevOps or does it have to be DevSecOps? But even worse than that, if we go to designers and say, hey, designers, you should do this cool DevOps thing. It's really awesome. They look at us and they say, well, I'm not a developer. I'm not an ops. What are you even talking about? But on the other hand, whatever we call it, I think ultimately what we're talking about is building curiosity and humility and the willingness to listen and respect for all of each other's ordinary wisdom and value and insight into the fabric of our work. And if we can do that, then I think we truly have something that we can be really deeply proud of and that we can offer to the rest of the world in terms of how to approach thinking about work in the 21st century. So thank you very, very much. <laughs>